Okay. So, okay, welcome back. So today we're going to learn about the else clause in the while. Let's let's have a while loop. Let's say like this. And the, I'd like you guys to follow along here. So you guys type as well. Right? Write your own program as you're watching. If we say while n is less than 10, and then we say uh, n equals n minus, or actually let's say plus 1, okay? And we'll go print n, okay? And then we'll say else print uh, exhausted while loop. Okay? So, question before you guys, just without even looking at the else statement, um, just looking at the, the while loop, do you know what the output of this program is going to be? So, it's going to start out with 5, and then it's going to add numbers to it, but what's the first number it's going to print? Is it going to print 5 first? Yeah, it's going to print 6 first because we're adding before we're printing. So it's going to print 6. What's the last number it's going to print? Is it going to be like 9, 10, or 11? Make a prediction. See if you can figure it out. And here we go. It's 10. I hope you got that. So, also it printed exhausted the loop. That means the loop finished normally. We did not break out of the loop. However, if we go like this, if we say something like if n equals something like 8 break, at this point, now, if we run it, it prints 6, 7. It doesn't print the 8, but it also doesn't print exhausted the loop. That means that if the loop ends normally without a break, this gets printed. If the loop does break, so you could maybe put a note here. Uh, you could say skips else. I wonder if that purple is very visible. Um, okay, so if you if you break, it'll skip the else. If you else now um, prints if loop ends naturally. Okay, so there's. That's what the else is about. Because essentially, if we if we got if we got rid of this else, let's just say for, we got rid of it for a second. And now if we run this code, it'll print six seven exhausted. It it'll quit the loop, it'll go and execute the next line. Right? But by oops. Uh, it, it, the else statement will only be executed if the loop ends naturally, not with a break. So that's the else part. Um, remember, I don't ever, so let, let's just, I want to show you guys how to save stuff without deleting it is you make it three comments and then go like that. Okay? So at this point, I'm going to copy this code. I'll go shift, arrow down, I'll go control C, and I'll paste it here. I'll get rid of the else at this point because that's not what I want to teach at this point. I want to I want to just quickly review uh, continue. So if I change this, 
break to a continue, can you predict what's going to happen? Try and figure out what the answer is going to be. It's going to start at 6 again. Is it going to print 8 or is it going to print or uh, sorry is it going to skip printing 8 or is it going to skip printing 9? Let's try it. So it skips 8. Right? Because at this point it turns it into an 8 and if it's 8 it skips. Remember what I talked to you about continue. Continue is just like the word skip. However, I don't ever want to see students put the continue at the bottom of the loop. In other words, after the continue there is a line of code, the print line. So that makes sense because you're skipping something below continue. Sometimes students will do this. Ready? Watch this. And now they'll run it and it works fine. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's what they want. And when I when I see this in students code, I say, that's wrong. You shouldn't put continue at at the end of the loop. And students tell me, but it works, Mr. R. Why should I remove it? Because the answer is you don't need it there. It's superfluous, unnecessary. Question, if you put continue there, what are you skipping below it? There's nothing to skip. So therefore, you don't need to put continue. A while loop will continue naturally, right? So if we delete that, it still does the same thing. So please, I'm warning you, don't put continue at the end of a while loop. The only place you would put continue is in an if statement where a condition is met and there is code below the continue inside the loop which you're skipping. Okay? Where it, where it actually has a purpose. So, um, last time I, uh, I gave you guys a little assignment and I said, hey, uh, Print out all the numbers between 1 to 20 that are even. We didn't go over the solution to that yet, I don't think. So let's go over that now. So let's say um, n equals 0. And let's say n is uh, less than 20. Or we could even say less than or equal to 20. And then we could say, uh, we'll start at 1. So we'll go n equals n plus 1. And then we'll say if n mod 2 equals 0, print n. Okay? And so if we run this, we get all the uh, even numbers from 1 to 20. However, uh, if you were sneaky and you didn't want to use mod, you could have simply done it like this. Right? And then just said print n. And if we run this, and let's actually comment out the first part here. And so, well, actually, we end up getting 22 there as well. So maybe we should have said just less than. There you go. OK? But uh, I kind of wanted you to use the mod. Uh, the solution to the guessing game uh, is in our textbook, Byte of Python. Uh, 
So I'm not really going to go over that one since it's it's in the it's in our textbook. Uh, but I am going to give you guys a new problem to solve, and that is I want you to write a program using a while loop, short one, okay, called, this is a really easy, so I'm not going to give you a lot of time for this, uh, Simon, call it Simon, and the way it should work, Simon being uh, a play on Simon Says, it should ask you to type something, it should repeat it until you type quit and then it should stop. So it'll ask you to type something and whatever you type it'll print what you type and then it'll ask you to type something else. It'll continue this forever until you type quit. And when you type quit the program will be over. Call it simon.py take a few minutes to do it and pause the video. Okay, we're back. And um, so the solution to this problem, where we are uh, um, basically, we'll, it's kind of like a Simon Says game. We're just gonna, we're just going to um, uh, go into a while true loop. And oops, forgot the full colon there. And then we're gonna say, uh, Uh, response equals input say something okay and then we will print the response You said okay and and that's it. The problem now is this program's not going to ever end because it's a while true. So now we could say here right after that before we print it, we could say if response equals quit. break. And that's it. Let's run this code. Uh, you can see it there. Say something. Hi. Bye. Hello. Um, you know, you could say anything. And there you go. And if we type in quit, it's over. Okay, so that's what I was looking for there. The next, the next uh, assignment that I'm going to give you is going to be a little bit more challenging. What I want you to do is modify this such that it asks you not to not to say a word, but rather to type in a number. And every time you type in the number it will add that number to a total and tell you what your running total is. We haven't done this one, have we? Did we do this one already? Oh, okay, we did this one. Uh, I'm going to, and then I think, uh, I think maybe the solution to that was like, I think I typed in quit and then I think we've already gone through this one. Okay, I remember it. So let's 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 try a different one. Uh, I want to actually go back and show you the solution that I had to the guessing game that was in the textbook. So the solution to in the textbook is fine, but I also wanted to show you this one. Um, I know you're probably wondering what this first line is, but that's on uh, Linux systems. You could put that if you wanted to execute this. Uh, Python program as like a, 
in a different way without using Python. I'm not going to teach you that because most of you are using uh, Windows or Mac, so you can just ignore this. Um, so in this in this program, I actually made a full blown game out of it by using the random library, and that's what I want. That's part of the reason why I wanted to show you this. Is on line two, I'm importing the library called random. So if you're wondering what can random do, oh, let's get rid of this. Uh, if you start up an interpreter and you go Python 3 and you go, and this time we're going to remember to import random, and then you type in help bracket random, and now you'll see what the random library can do. Uh, the the ones that are useful as programmers are the methods that do not start with under under. So the under under are internal methods or functions, which we haven't learned what they are yet. But there is things like choice, choices, uh, all other ones that I don't use very much. Um, and then there's rand range. And there's sample. So I, I tend to use things like choice, rand range, and sample. Those are pretty useful. And there's a description of how it works there. But you can hit Q to get out of that and Control D to get out of that. But I'm going to come back here and show you what I did. I have to set a lower limit, so I'm asking the user to guess from and set an upper limit to guess to. And I have to change that to an integer. Then I'm going to go and use random.randrange. So whenever you use a library, you have to type in the library name and then dot to use one of the functions. So we can't just type in randrange unless we import it in a different way, which I don't want to show you right now. So um, we're going to use brackets there, and we're going to send two arguments the lower and the upper. And the upper one has to be one more than where we want to go. So that's why I've added one to. So for example, if we wanted to go from 1 to 100, we'd have to put in 1, 101. And then I have an extra feature here called count. Because I want to record how many tries it takes the person to get to the answer. And so I have a while true here, which is just going to go into the loop and exit, I mean, sorry, run forever until I exit with the break. I'm going to ask the user once and only once to take a guess. Then I'm going to increment the count. In other words, say, all right, you've taken one guess now. That counts as one count. And I'm going to test to see if the guess equals the random number which was generated on line eight. If it's correct, if they're equal, I break out of the loop and I come down here and I say print congrats. And then I say it took you count guesses to win with the F string. The line before is how to do it without an F string. But personally, I prefer the F string. Uh, if they get it wrong, if the guess is greater than Rand, I'll print too high. And of course, the only other uh, logical uh, possibility is it's too low. So I actually don't need an elif for that. I could just use an else. So if I run this, okay, guess from 1 to 100, take a guess, 50, too low. Take a guess, 75, too high. Uh, take a guess, 52. Uh, no, not 52, sorry, 62. Too high. Okay, how about 56? Too high. 53. Congrats. It took you five guesses to win. Okay? So the cool thing about this now is that every time I play it, it's going to be a different number. 1, 100. Take a guess. 50. Too high. 
25, too low. Okay? So I could say something like, uh, I don't know, 37, too low. Um, how about 43? Uh, too low. How about uh, 46? Too low. Wow. Okay. Um, 48? Wow. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to have to go now to, I guess it's 47. So yeah, I didn't do too well on that one. But notice every time I run it, it's going to be different. I'm not going to run it again. But my point is, this is actually good code, and I'd like you to, uh, you know, copy it, test it out yourself, and understand everything that's that's going on. If you don't understand anything, then, uh, like I said, if you don't understand Rand range, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. But remember the second argument has to be one more than where you want to go. Okay? You can also, like I said, look up the information in the help. So, uh, what's next? Uh, the next stuff we're going to do is we're going to learn about for loops. So, remember, a while loop, we do something when we don't know how many times something has to be executed. On the other hand, a for loop, which we're about to learn now, we can go to our textbook and scroll down to the for loop. And let's take a look at what the for loop is like. So it says here for i in range 1 comma 5 print i. Ah, oh, they've got this stupid else again. I really dislike this else statement with loops. Um, so let's go through some examples. There's a lot of examples that we're going to do um, with for loops. So yeah, they they don't really have a lot on for loops in here. So I guess the best way to learn this is um, through example. Okay. So um, let's create a new file and let's save it as. Uh, Let's save it as uh, four one dot py. Okay. So, how do you write for loops? All you say is for. Now, before we before we begin this, actually, let me open up a, a terminal and show you some things on the in the interpreter because this is a good this is a good opportunity for me to show you how this range function works. So, this is a built-in function into Python, and it's called range. So if I type in range 4, I want you guys to do this as well. Don't just watch. Type in your own terminal. If you type range 4, now in this case, uh, this is something that's different about Python 3 versus Python 2. Python 2 would actually give you a, uh, a list here. Uh, this doesn't. This is giving you an iterable. Um, so therefore, I'm going to actually use... I'm going to get out of this and I'm going to go into IPython. Uh, IPython is like the, a Python uh, interpreter on steroids. That's right, you heard it. IPython is Python's interpreter on steroids. So if I do something like 4i in 
range four, and then I say print i. What I'm going to get is zero to three. Okay, so and to show you what range is really doing, I have to actually ask it to change it to change the uh, what range is doing into a list explicitly. And when I do that, you'll notice that it produces 0, 1, 2, 3. However, if I don't use list, it's still an iterable, which, and I know you're not going to understand what this means, it'll yield the values of 0, 1, 2, 3, 1 at a time. That's why if I just simply type in range 4, it just says range 0 to 4, which is 0 to 3. Because the last number, the second number right here, if you can see my mouse, this number here, it doesn't get to that number. It gets to 1 less than that number. But it starts at the first number. So this is something you really have to make note of in Python. And notice it starts counting at zero, right? Why? Because computer scientists, all of us, we count from zero, not from one. The four will iterate over whatever this returns. So for example, watch what I could say here. For uh, name in, and I can do a thing, and I can say here Bob, Alice, Mike, uh, Sarah. I can't type. There we go. And so now, if I say print name, it'll iterate through whatever it whatever is it comes after the in so notice here i had to type all those names in one by one now that if it's a strings okay so you might have to type them in but if they're numbers i i, I wouldn't want to have to do this right so i mean you can actually use I, i'll explain what the square brackets and uh, parentheses are later but for now we can just go like this but actually we should start from zero okay there now in this case we shouldn't really use name because um, one two three is are not really names right and so if I ran this I'd get zero one two three just like before just like up here But, so what's the benefit of using range then? Well, what if I wanted to print out a hundred numbers? Now, are you going to sit there and, and type a hundred numbers? No, that's ridiculous. But you notice that, look how easy that is. And if I change this to a thousand, I'd only have to add one more zero. So this is really powerful. Remember, I'm going to say this again. For loops are used for iterating a known number of times. So if you know how many times you're going to iterate, then you use a for loop. If you don't know how many times you're going to iterate, you use a while loop. That's the difference between the two. OK? Um, so let's start again, and uh, let's try printing the numbers, say, from 1 to 10, not from 0. So in this case, I would go 1. I'd st I want to start at 1. Now I have to put a comma. And now you say, OK, if, do I, if I want to go to 10, do I put 10? Is that going to work? No, it doesn't work. Because remember, I'm, say, I'm saying this multiple times so that it sinks in. I have to go one more 
than where I want to get to. So in this case, now I'm going to get to 10. Okay? Uh, now there is another argument which I can use for range, and that is actually a third argument. And that's called the step. And the step is, you ever, you ever, you know, climb a, a staircase? Usually you go one step at a time, right? Unless you're young and fast and strong, then you can take two steps at a time, right? So if you take two steps at a time, that's where the step argument comes in. So the arguments are, the first one is where to begin. The second argument after the comma is where to stop, but you have to go one more. So this is going to stop at, this is going to get to 10, including 10, but not 11. And the third argument is how many do you jump? So if I run this, it starts at 1, but then it skips 2 to 3, and then it skips 2 to 5, and 2 to 7, and 2 to 9. Notice it doesn't print 10 because 9 plus 2 is 11, and we can't get to 11. If we wanted to get to 11, we had to have put 12 here. You always have to go one more than where you're going to get to. Okay? Now, this is kind of cool because we can also move backwards. In other words, if I was to stay, say start at uh, 10 and go backwards to 1, would this work? Let's try it. It does nothing. This did nothing. But let's try it again. This time, let's put a step here. Oops, wrong place. Let's put a step here of negative 1. In other words, we're saying start at 10, go to 1. But is it going to get to 1? Here's the question. It doesn't get to 1. Remember. The second argument has to be one more than where you want to get to. But when I mean more, in this case on the number line, if you start at 10 and move backwards towards 1, one more than 1 in the direction you're going would be 0. And so now when I run this, I get 10 to 1. So it's not going to get to zero. So if you think of it like adding one, but I'm adding one in the direction I'm going, right? Which in essence is subtracting one in this case, because I'm moving backwards. So uh, that's a for loop, all right? So. Uh, we could do other things. So for example, you could say something like, all right, uh, let's start at 0 and let's go to 100. But instead of counting by 1s, let's say let's count by 5s. And so 5, 10, 15, 20. And if you wanted to include 100, then we have to go 101. And now, it would include 100. So this is super powerful, very, very powerful. Um, but I want you to understand that you can iterate over not just something that produces numbers, but anything that is iterable. Okay. So in other words, what I have highlighted right now has to be iterable. Now, range produces an iterable. In this case, it's producing integers. But what else is iterable? Well, what kind of data types have you learned so far? You saw me create a, a sequence of names in brackets. We'll learn later on that's actually called a tuple. And if you use square brackets, you'll learn that that's called a list. 
but that's for later. You've already learned another data type which is iterable, and that is a string. And this is super cool. Watch this. So now I can go for x in. Now we don't use range because range is basically for generating a sequence of numbers. Okay, and we've learned how to modify that sequence of numbers in a variety of ways. But what if I just set, wrote a string now? What if I wrote something like uh, happy birthday? Like that. That's a string, right? And now, if I run this, it look at how cool that is. It iterates through every letter in the string. So now, if you have a string and you want to analyze it, you want to find some letters in a string, or you want to look at every individual letter in a string and do something with them, that's how you would iterate over the string. Look how simple that is. For And it, by the way, it doesn't have to be x, okay? You could say, for letter in, print letter. That's just the variable name. I don't want you to get into the uh, rigid mindset that it always has to, the, always, the variable has to be an x. It doesn't. It can be whatever you want it to be. And also, you don't have to print things either. My, the printing here is just an example of what you could do with it. Okay? For example, you could do mathematics with stuff. And here comes my next little story. So, story time. Dun, dun, dun. A long time ago, uh, a very long time ago, there was a little tiny elementary school. And in this elementary school, there was a little boy. And he was, you know, nondescript, little child. And uh, I think it was probably grade one or so. And they had a mean teacher, kind of like me. And the teacher said, all right, take out your blackboards. They didn't have paper back then, so they had to take out a blackboard when they had a little piece of chalk. And they, they put it on their desk. And the teacher said, uh, I want all of you to add the numbers from 1 to 100. You have one hour to complete this task. And so the, the kids started going 1 plus 2, uh, uh, that's 3, plus 3, uh, that's 6, uh, plus 4, that's 10, and so while they were doing this, and they had gotten about that far, one little boy, this little boy that the story is about, put his hand up. And the teacher was kind of annoyed because he knew he hadn't finished yet. He probably thought, oh, maybe he has to go to the bathroom. And uh, the little boy said, the teacher said, yes, what is it? And he said, I'm finished. And the teacher said, no, 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 you can't possibly be finished. And he said, I am. And now all the other students in the class stopped and looked at him. How could he possibly be finished? So the teacher said, all right, if you're so smart, what's the answer? And the boy said, 5,050. And the teacher's jaw dropped. And all the other kids in the class were dumbfounded. They didn't know if it was right. And the teacher said, you're right. And now the teacher was really confused because the teacher said, how did you do that? And so I'm now going to show you. Are you ready? So let's bring up uh, a program here so that I can actually use this as a as a board and um, so okay so 
this a little bit too thick. So uh, let me try going. No, that's the wrong way. OK, so that's, that's uh, a good size for my pen. Um, now, so here is the number line. And we're going to start at 1. And here is 100. So what this little boy, so let's, let's actually continue a little bit, a few more. 2, 3. And this one's 99, and this one would be 98. And then in the middle here, of course, we'd have uh, 49, and then we'd have 50, and we'd have uh, 51. So, and we'd have uh, 52. Now, well. What the boy said is, I didn't add the numbers like this in sequence. And the reason he said I didn't add them that way is because I don't have to. Because multiplication, sorry, not multiplication, addition is commutative. What does commutative mean? It means 1 plus 2 is the same as 2 plus 1. It doesn't matter in which, in which order you add things. So therefore, he said, I chose not to add them sequentially. He said, I ordered, I ordered them into pairs like this. He said, I added 1 plus 100. And he said, that is equal to 101. Then he said, I added 2 and 99. And he said, that's equal to 101. Then he said, I added 3 and 98. And that's equal to 101. And the, and the final pair, right, this one, 50 and 51, when you add them, it equals 101. And so what he said is, I realized that if I add them by pairing them up, I, he said, I have 50 pairs. And each of those pairs adds up to 101. And so I simply, he said, if you add 50 pairs of each of 101, if you multiply it, the answer becomes simply 5,050. And that's the answer. And if you're wondering who this little boy was, he became the greatest mathematician of all time. His name is none other than Carl Frederick Gauss. Dun, dun, dun. So um, what are we going to do right now? Are we going to do the same thing? No, but I want you to understand having an efficient algorithm can be very powerful, super powerful. Okay. Instead, we are going to write a computer program to do it the hard way, sequentially. I want you, right now, to write a program that's going to add all the numbers from 1 to 100. You know what the answer is supposed to be. It's supposed to be 5,050. But I want you to use a for loop to do it. And remember, you're going to have to have a variable for the sum for the total. All right? Give it a shot. Write a for loop that's going to add the numbers from 1 to 100, 100 the hard way. Not the way, uh, don't just go 50, print 50 times 101. That's not the way I'm looking for. I want you to do it the difficult way, but fortunately, you have the advantage of having a supercomputer at your fingertips. Go, pause the video. Okay, uh, we're back. So let's see if you can, or if you got the solution. So what I would do is, I would simply start a for loop. But before I start the for loop, I'm going to have to have a variable, let's say that's called total, 
and I'm going to have to set it equal to zero because I'm going to have to store the total value or the total of all the numbers somewhere. So I'm going to say now, I could say for x in range, and I'm going to go 1 comma 101 because I want to go to 100. And then I will say total equals total plus x. And that's it. Then I'll just go print after the loop is finished. I'll go print total. And if I run this, I get 5,050. And that's the solution to uh, the story. Although it's you know four lines of code, so it's pretty easy to do if you have a computer. You don't have to use. Although I mean, if you if you if you knew Gauss's if you had Gauss's brain, uh, then you could just go print 50 times 101. Although in this case, that's cheating, uh, even though it's going to give you the same answer. So our next uh, problem is another story. Are you guys ready? Okay, here we go. So, uh, story time. Tell your parents that you've decided to quit school. That's right. And if they ask you why, tell them, you know, in, in the old days, right, I would say, uh, tell them you found a job in the newspaper and you would hold up a newspaper but today I would say tell them you found a job on the internet and uh, the job is being a janitor at your local high school uh, and here's the thing because the students are so messy in your high school there's so much garbage to clean up. Your school is offering the enormous sum of $10,000 per year? Month? Per month? That, that sounds pretty good. No. 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 They're offering $10,000 per day. <laughs> That's right. I know. You're like, where do I sign up? I'm, I'm taking that job. I don't care if I have to clean up the world's biggest mess. I'll do that for $10,000 a day. No problem. I'm in. Okay. There's a little catch, though. The problem is, is that after 30 days, your school's going to run out of money. And so they can only hire you for 30 days. So one month. Okay? On the other hand, you're, you kind of scratch your head and you go, hmm, I wonder if I could get a job somewhere else. And uh, you find a local big box store which will 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 leave it nameless right now and uh, it might be like a let's say a, a grocery store or something like that and uh, at this local grocery store you're going to be you know uh, you walk in and you talk to the manager and you say sir I'm really young I'm just a high school student but I'm willing to work for almost nothing because I need job experience. So you say, and the, the manager now has a bit of a smile, and, and, and you say, uh, I'm willing to work for very little. And the, and, the, and the manager says, well, what are we talking about? Minimum wage? And you laugh and say, oh, no, no, no. Now that's far too much. Uh, I would be willing 
to work for a one penny and the and the manager says per hour and you say oh no 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 that's far too much uh, per day and now the manager says well Sonny you found a job and then you say ah but hold on a minute uh, let's just make it more interesting because you know if if I do if I'm if I'm if I'm gonna work here then I need some incentive to stay right so he said so you say I'd like my pay to double every day and so now the manager is a little bit confused because he thinks you're trying to trick him. And so he says, uh, well, how much is that going to be? And you say, okay, well, so the first day I'll make one penny. Then the next day I'll make, on day two, I'll make two pennies. And then the next day I'll make four pennies. And then the next day I'll make eight pennies. And then the next day I'll make... 16 pennies and then the next day I'll make 32 pennies and then the next day I'll make 64 pennies and he says you know by the end of the week I'll have enough money to buy a chocolate bar and then the manager seems quite happy at this and so he says okay uh, but he's still a little worried he's still a little worried so then you say to him, oh, and by the way, uh, I can only work for the month because if I, uh, my parents aren't allowing me to work any longer to be out of school. They say I have to go back to school, so I, I can only work for one month, so it's not going to add up to much, right? I might be able to buy like, let's say, four or five chocolate bars by the end of the month. And so the, the manager says, no problem, you got a deal. And then what you do is you take out a little contract and you say, all right, then just sign here. And uh, the manager signs it and you're good to go. Now the question is, and I know you're probably a little suspicious too. I have a question for you before we continue. Would you take the janitor job cleaning your school for $10,000 a day for 30 days, and I'm sure you can figure out how much that is, right? It's more than a quarter of a million dollars, okay? You can buy some really nice stuff with that. Or would you take your chances and go with the starting with one penny on the first day and you only get to work 30 days? So here's my question, here's my assignment task for you today, and that is, I want you to dis first of all decide which job you take and be honest with yourself and then then now you don't have to write a program for the um, cleaning your school job because you already know how much money that's going to be oh yeah, that's just a simple multiplication right 30 times 10,000 but I want you to write a program to find out how much money you're going to make if you worked at the grocery store at one penny on the first day, doubling your pay for 30 days. And remember, I want to stress something. You're not calculating how much money you're going to make on the last day. Your calculation has to add up all of your pays, including the like the first day, which is like one penny, it has to add up all those amounts to get to a final result. Okay? Question, do you know how many days you're gonna work? Answer, yes, you're working 30 days. Therefore, what type of a loop are you going to use? A for loop or a while loop? A definite loop is a for loop, right? Come up with the sum. Come up with the total of money that you make. Good luck. I hope your parents support your new endeavor. We'll go through the answer or the solution next time. See ya.